Welcome to this presentation uh, on helping your child regulate emotions, and this is targeted towards parents and carers. My name is Dr. Dadani Lotlo, and I'm a counseling psychologist, and I supervise one of the educational uh, well-being practitioner teams in Sutton, and we support um, adolescents in secondary schools and parents in primary schools to manage low-level mental health and behavioral difficulties. So why have a presentation like this? I am hoping to offer an understanding of why important, why emotions are important, how they impact on behavior, uh, an understanding of what emotional regulation is and why that's important. And also I'm hoping to offer some practical tips that children can use to manage their emotions and feelings. And these are tips that you might be able to help them develop. But why include parents and carers in this? So there's this quote, which I think sums it up, but um, we'll see what you think. So it's up to parents to teach their children about emotions. Kids have these big feelings inside, but don't yet possess an understanding of what they mean or where they come from. And sometimes that's incredibly scary to a little kid. And a lot of what um, children are going to learn or at least start learning about the world is going to come from their experiences with their family, with the caregivers around them. And so there is a privilege here um, for parents, carers, adults to help children understand and make sense of these emotions that they'll feel um, and understand their temperament and what works best for them in managing the emotions that they have. I find useful in helping to conceptualize that role that parents and carers have in a child's social and emotional development is um, this concept, which is the circle of security. Um, and this, this offers this understanding that as parents, carers, um, adults in children's lives, we have the um, ability to, to act as a secure base. And with that secure base, the child is able to feel supported enough to go out and explore the world. So they have that sense of security that allows them confidence to go out and and explore the world around them. And as they do so, what they need from the from the adult, the parent, the carer that is their secure base is they need them. Uh, they need the adult to watch over them, to delight in them, to help the child, to enjoy the child. And when the child experiences um, a bit of difficulty or finds that actually what they what they need is a sense of safety. They're going to look to you, that adult in their life, for protection, comfort, delight. Um, they're going to look for support in organizing their feelings as they come back to that sense of safety. So that means that as the parents and carers and adults in children's lives, that there is a role for us to play in offering a sense of security that's going to encourage exploration, but also offering a sense of safety that's going to help the child regulate, help the child feel comforted and protected so that they can once again feel safe enough to go out into the world and explore. And really then that 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 establishes that the, the really uh, key part of helping a child develop their ability to regulate emotions is to attend to the relationship that you have with the child so that the child does learn the experience of security and safety, knowing that whatever emotion they have, they can manage with the help of that secure base and safe haven, and that's going to help them as they grow up to know what to do with these big emotions that can sometimes be quite difficult to manage, particularly as a child. So what good are emotions? Before we answer that question, another question is how many emotions can you name? And it, it's really interesting um, just to consider the kind of vocabulary we have for the different emotions that we can feel. Um, we have the movie Inside Out, which offers us insight into the fact that actually we can have a number of emotions sort of going on at the same time. And then those emotions can interact with, the, with each other to cause other types of emotions. So joy and fear might create a feeling of surprise. So it's really interesting just to think for a moment, how many words do you have available to describe the different types of things that you might feel? You might find that it, it can be difficult to name, you know, the vast number of possible feelings. So 
you know, just imagine how how much more difficult it is going to be for that child to name all the things that they might feel so that they then know what to do about it. So the one challenge to you as that parent and carer in your child's life is to build up their vocabulary for what they might feel might what they might be feeling, you know, to think, you know, is it sadness? Is it happiness? Is it frustration? Is it confusion? Just so that they have all the more resource to to help them understand what they might be feeling at any given point. So let's think about what emotions are for. Uh, imagine if we didn't have emotions and how we might be going about our lives. Emotions provide us with a signal that something significant is happening, and that signal is often very important for our survival. And because it's a survival based sort of uh, phenomenon, a lot of the times you find that certain emotions are hardwired and automatic and we can't necessarily um, stop them starting. So we might think about whenever we, we get startled or scared or if you happen to cross the road at the wrong time and you see a car coming you, you'll have a, a reaction within you and a sense of fear and emotion that's going to cause you to jump out of the way and it's important for that reaction to be quite quick uh, and to for it to be automatic uh, and for it to be quite powerful so that the appropriate action which is survival based follows um, so it's it's useful to understand that emotions need to be as impactful as they are so that we are able to then do the things that we need to do because the other thing about emotions is that they help to motivate us to take action to change a situation or they help us process a situation so if we think about anger that can be a very motivating and activating emotion. When we get angry we have the sense that perhaps something is unfair and rather than um, sort of letting things go on, we might have the, the, the ability and the motivation to take action, to speak up, to change something about the situation. So we also can find that, that, that crying, for example, or just talking about your emotions and expressing them can offer the an, an, a cathartic uh, experience where we're able to kind of reset um, and, and, and feel as if we've gotten a load off of our shoulders because we've had that opportunity to express. But we often need the emotion to help instigate that process. Emotions can also communicate and they communicate to other people, but also impact other people. If we think about a baby that's crying and continues to cry, um, the, the parent is going to know that the baby needs something, but is also going to be motivated to do something about that crying just because of the response that el it elicits in the parent or the carer. So emotions are important. And with that understanding, we then can start thinking about what emotional regulation is. Um, the, the, the definition that we have here is that emotional regulation refers to a person's ability to process and express their feelings in a constructive way. And that might mean being able to understand the function that the emotion they're, they're experiencing is having, what, it, what it's trying to communicate and signal, and what needs to happen so that the emotion does its job and is expressed in a meaningful way that ultimately brings about the action that that is required. So the foundations of being able to regulate one's emotions, regulate oneself, is first of all being able to identify the emotion. Remember we talked about the vocabulary that we might have for our emotions. The more we can pinpoint what a particular em emotion is, the more effective that process of emotional regulation will be. So once you've pinpointed that I am feeling sad, then you might then be able to think, OK, but how sad I'm feeling compared to when my dog died? Um, is this more or less? So being able to understand where you are in the spectrum of emotions is important and helping your child do the same is also going to be quite important for them as they learn the different types of emotions and the different degrees of emotions that they feel. Uh, and also understanding the triggers. So the, these com these make up the second aspect of being able to regulate one's emotion. First, being able to identify the emotions, so sadness. Uh, the second, being able to understand the degree of the intensity of the emotion and the triggers. So I might say, I know that I'm feeling sad. 
and I'm feeling sad if I were to raise it out of uh, five, one to five, five being quite extreme, I'd say it's at a two. Uh, not as bad as it has been, but it's, it's, it's notable. And I'm feeling sad because my friend didn't say hello to me today. I know why, that's the trigger. And then once you once you've done those two parts, then you're able to do the third, which is to think about doing something useful to manage the feeling. So if I know that what I'm feeling is sadness, I might think about the types of things that get me out of that state of sadness and perhaps into something a bit more joyful. So listening to my favorite song. But I might also think if this is about a relationship and a sense of not being acknowledged by a friend, I might do something in relation to that person and maybe go to them and check if everything is OK or just share with them how I was feeling and if they have any um, anything to help me understand what might be going on for them. So those are three three important things that can be useful when you're thinking about emotional regulation for your child, helping them understand the emotion, helping them understand the degree of the intensity and the thing that has caused the emotion, but also helping them understand what they can do about the feeling they have um, so they resolve and manage it in a helpful way. But another thing uh, that can be helpful as we try and understand emotional regulation is to think in terms of the flight or fight response. So we might say that the ultimate objective in emotional regulation is to help reduce your child's excessive activation in the nervous system, which can cause an inappropriate fight or flight response. So what is the fight or flight response? This is something that I am certain everybody has experienced. And this is that very uh, natural and necessary response that we have whenever we're faced with a threat or uh, something that causes anxiety. And it might be more our thoughts than something that we're faced with. But you know the feeling when your heart starts starts racing, maybe it comes a little bit more difficult to breathe. Um, you might feel a bit of churning in your stomach, a bit of nausea, uh, restlessness, um, sweating, wanting to run, not being able to sleep. All of these things count as part of what we call the fight or flight response, which is driven by that adrenaline that's triggered when we have um, a sense of threat or a challenge ahead of us. And what it's basically doing is causing changes in our body that are going to physically enable us to run away or to fight the thing that's causing us this anxiety and that's posing a threat. But the thing is, a lot of the times running away or fighting is not the appropriate response to the things that cause us anxiety today. So, for example, your child might um, be afraid of leaving you at the school gates. Um, they, they may uh, get restless, they may want to run, they may start maybe hitting out just because of how much they want to stay and, they and they're not able, they don't think that they're able to spend the day without you. In that moment, fight or flight is not going to be as helpful, but it's what they're experiencing. And so when we're thinking about emotional regulation, what we want to do is help the child understand this is a natural experience to be having. Of course, um, you know, you're feeling anxious, that makes sense. But let's see how we can bring down the activation of the nervous system, that fight or flight response, so that you can then do the things that you need to do to manage the emotions you're having in a constructive way. And, and again, there, there are many ways of thinking about um, emotions, the fight or flight system, arousal states, you know, whether we are in a in a place of um, being quite uh, energized. Um, so, you know, we can think of Tigger and Eeyore and Pooh. And because of the fight or flight system, because of our arousal states, what we might find is that we can be too high and, and maybe your child might be like Tigger bouncing off of the walls and just really excited. And that is going to um, represent what the fight or flight system is doing. Ear, on the other hand, might be representing a, a point in our arousal states and in our emotions where we're actually quite low and sad and slow. And that might be another another presentation, another way that your child might be um, 
showing up. But what you want is for them to be like poo, somewhere right in the middle. Uh, and on the bottom here, we've got the alert programs representation of this idea that we can all move between different states. So we might be our engines might be running too high uh, and, and we're going too fast. Our engines are going really slow. Like here, the turtle, we're not able to kind of meet the demands of the day. Things are just not really moving. And then we might be just right. And that's usually where we want to be. Or we might have this idea of being hyper aroused and that's in our in our fight or flight system where we're anxious, angry, out of control, overwhelmed. Um, or we might be in that hypo arousal state where everything is kind of slower and we're numb, um, spaced out, shutting down, and that might be in the freeze mode. So I, I share all of this just to help you conceptualize where your child might be sometimes and perhaps this is something you might use with your child for them to tell you what is it where they think they are are they feeling a bit high like t like tigger are they feeling a bit low like eeyore do they feel they're just right or you know is it helpful to think okay you are going really your, your your engine is running really high moving really fast what can we do to kind of slow things down just a little bit so that you're just right i think that these visual demonstrations of how we can change between arousal states and often our emotions are going to change with those states uh, can be helpful and what you want to be communicating to your child is what do we need to do to get you just right A question for you, are difficult emotions bad? Because we know sometimes that we can feel things like anger or guilt or jealousy, and they can have a real impact on us. And a lot of the times, again, it might be hard to understand why we have these feelings or to sit with these feelings. So they can feel quite negative, but the question is, are emotions in and of themselves bad? And I'd like to suggest that they're not in and of themselves, they're not bad. And I think that can be something important to communicate to your child, for example, who, when they get angry, may do things like um, hit other people or say things, and that might make them say things that are quite negative. The response and, and, the, and the guilt that they might feel might make them feel that they are bad because they, their emotions make them do things that may be considered bad. But an important uh, thing to communicate as you help your child manage these emotions is to reinforce that they themselves are not bad and that the relationship that you have with them still stands, you still care for them, but the things that their emotions might cause them to do could be counted as negative or bad. And that's the part that you might want to be able to change with them. But emotions themselves make us human and they are important. So a question to you, again, what does your child do when they find it hard to manage their emotions? Do they start screaming? Do they start crying? Do they fight with other people? Do they just find it really hard to settle down? Um, do they say things that can be kind of hurtful? Now, it's interesting that when children are feeling these very strong emotions, it can sometimes be easier for them to show the emotions through certain types of behaviors or speaking in a certain kind of way than it is for them to kind of sit down and tell you uh, and express to you in that constructive way what emotions they're feeling. Children will often use behavior as a way to communicate their emotions. And so as parents and carers and adults, we have to be really curious about what is the emotion underneath the behavior that the child is finding easier to display. So, for example, you might have the behavior of ripping up homework and, and, and you might look at that and if you just look at, at the behavior, you might think, well, this is very bad because that homework has to go to school tomorrow and this is not acceptable, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at that behavior, then it might make sense to be punitive towards the child because there are consequences if you rip up your homework. But then if you're curious about the, the emotion underneath that, you might then think or you might find that actually um, the child is, is quite frustrated at not being able to answer the question and is feeling quite negative about themselves because of that. And so then there might be something in terms of 
their self-esteem or be needing a sense needing a bit of support in in the homework so you'll have a different understanding of what's needed by the child once you're curious about the emotions underneath the behavior if a child is having a tantrum at bedtime you might think, well, we don't have time for you to have a tantrum at bedtime. It's bedtime. You need to be able to get enough sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But with some curiosity about the emotion underneath that, you might be able to piece things together and think, OK, so they might be feeling upset uh, because if we think about what happens in the evening, they weren't able to spend as much time with 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 me, their parent. Um, and so then it makes a little bit more sense about why they might be having that tantrum and then you might know, well, the thing that they need more of is that quality time in order to manage these behaviors. Refusing to clear up toys, that in itself uh, can be something that's disruptive, that, that affects the rest of the day, etc. But if you're curious about the emotion, you might find that the, the child is, is showing that and or yeah, the child is showing that they're upset that playtime has finished and and to an extent the function of that behavior is to extend playtime though it may not be in the most fun way so basically the point is to be curious about what we don't see on the surface on the surface a lot of the time is the undesirable behavior the thing that is going to cause us to think well what consequence uh, needs to be put in place. It's going to make us think, what do we do to stop this unwanted behavior? Punishments might make a lot of sense in this case, but if we think about it as an iceberg and think there's probably loads more than we uh, can see beneath the surface, then we get curious about, is there a need here that hasn't been met that we could meet in order to eliminate the need for the behavior? Are there emotions underneath uh, this behavior that are difficult for the child to manage. And so if we focus on self-regulation and emotional regulation, that's going to help decrease the undesirable behavior that we're seeing. Or you might then be curious about triggers. Maybe the child is just a bit more sensitive to certain things like sounds and smells, etc. And that can make that can activate their their um, arousal state and make them just a little bit more, a, a little bit less settled so that they are showing these behaviors, showing that they're not um, comfortable in the environment that they're in. So I share this mostly, I mean, this th this image, if you can read it, um, has an emphasis on trauma, which is something that I'll talk about a little bit uh, in a few slides. But, but trauma can, can oftentimes present as undesirable behavior, but it's really important, particularly where a child has experienced something quite difficult, to think less about, well, what do I do to get rid of this behavior? And more about what can this behavior tell me about what the child needs or what the child has experienced or what the child might be more sensitive to. 